Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Wednesday, August 10th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, it's Hillary's vast left-wing conspiracy. Newly released Clinton emails shed light on the unholy alliance between the State Department and the Clinton Foundation. Meanwhile, Hillary continues to dodge questions about the Clinton cash cow. Then, the mainstream media accuses Donald Trump of plotting a Hillary Clinton assassination. If she gets to pick her judges, nothing you can do, folks. Although the Second Amendment people, maybe there is, I don't know. And a Texas lawyer says he will punish teachers who ban guns in their classrooms at UT. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Today we had a new group of emails that were revealed that Hillary Clinton previously tried to cover up. We're going to talk about what's in those emails. We're going to talk about what they tried to cover up, the payoffs involved. But before we do... I want to talk about Hillary Clinton's conspiracy theories, because Hillary Clinton, every time she's caught with her hands in the till, where she's caught uh, doing something illegal, she always brings out these red herrings, which in many cases now are turning into red scares. Remember when the DNC emails were released? She said that Donald Trump was working with Putin. And I had several people there at the uh, DNC that I talked to that tried to sell that ridiculous line. And now she's using that same line against Jill Stein. This is the Green Party candidate who's not on the ballot in very many states, who's only at three to four percent in the polls. Yet Hillary Clinton is so desperate, so concerned about Donald Trump. Why would she be concerned when the mainstream news media is telling us that uh, she's 15 points ahead of Donald Trump? He's so pathetic. He ought to just drop out. He's going to lose everything for the Republicans. No, that's not the reality. And if you look at their actions, you understand they don't believe that either. So, you know, when we see this kind of red scare that she's constantly throwing around here, it reminds me of McCarthyism. Remember, there was the House on American Activities Committee, HUAC, H-U-A-C. I think they just ought to change it to the Hillary on American Activities Committee because she's throwing these accusations around like Joe McCarthy himself. You know, it was back in, the, if you remember, Julia Child's husband back in the 1950s when all this was going on, simply because he'd been posted to Russia at one point. They pulled him in and questioned him, and he was basically knocked down in his career at the State Department because they were so paranoid about that. That's essentially what is happening with Jill Stein. And of course, Jill Stein is a hardcore socialist, but I don't believe she is a Putin puppet, as they're pointing out. What is the evidence that they have here? Well, the evidence is just like Julia Child's husband. She went to Moscow. She had her picture taken in Red Square. She went there for an RT anniversary conference, and she cut a video thanking her supporters for giving her the money to attend this conference. It is nothing but, as Mint Press points out, attacks and smear campaigns against anybody that is coming up in the polls or competition for Hillary Clinton. Okay, so this is coming out, and immediately journalist uh, Glenn Greenwald uh, refuted the accusation uh, that was tweeted out by Andrew Weiss. He says, uh, a day later in a tweet of his own, he says they're 100% false. He says it was only a matter of time before Jill Stein was smeared as a disloyal Kremlin sympathizer. That's precisely what they're doing now. Let's talk about the reality of what's going on with Hillary Clinton. Because there are real crimes here that are being committed, that have been committed, that they're trying to distract you from with these red herrings, okay? What was released today, CNN points out, newly released Clinton emails shed light on a relationship between the State Department and the Clinton Foundation. These are emails that were not leaked by WikiLeaks. These are emails that were finally obtained after four years of trying by Judicial Watch. And we're going to talk about how the State Department and others tried to cover this up for, the very, for a very long time. What they got were uh, 296 pages of emails, 44 that Judicial Watch says were not previously handed over by the State Department. Now, out of those uh, 44 emails, there are at least a little bit over 5% of these emails indicate criminal activity, pay for play activity. People from the Clinton Foundation contacting Huma Abedin, contacting Cheryl Mills, who were handling this for Hillary Clinton and saying, I've got somebody that needs access to the State Department, do it now. So here's some of the things that they said. This is a, a top Clinton official, Doug Band, who was lobbying Clinton aides for a job for somebody else in the State Department. And in the email, he tells Cheryl Mills and Huma Abedin, 
Quote, it's important to take care of, and they redacted the person's name. He reassured them that personnel has been sending him options, but you need to do this right away. And another one, this same Clinton Foundation official, the top Clinton Foundation official band, tells Abedin and Mills to put Gilbert Shigori, who is a Lebanese-Nigerian billionaire, in contact with the State Department's person of substance on Lebanon. Now, understand who this person is, okay? This is not your run-of-the-mill Nigerian uh, prince that you see on Craigslist. This guy is a real Nigerian, and he's a real criminal. He was convicted of money laundering. So, of course, uh, by the Swiss, of course he would be in contact with the Clintons. Uh, they got a whole network of money laundering criminals, and he paid, in a plea bargain, $66 million to keep from going to jail. But then he gets involved with the Clintons. And what he did with the Clintons, he gave them between $1 and $5 million. So they contact the State Department, and they say, uh, we need somebody that is of substance to talk to him right away. And they came back and said, well, we've got the guy. And then 20 minutes later, not even 20 minutes later, he sends back to them says, better if you call him. Now is preferable. This is very important. In other words, this guy gave us a lot of money. Don't wait. Get in touch with him right now. And as Judicial Watch President says, no wonder Hillary and Huma Abedin hid emails from the American people, the courts, and the Congress. This is in a press release. He said, they show the Clinton Foundation, Clinton donors, and operatives worked with Hillary Clinton in potential violation of the law. Okay? In another incident that was revealed in these, we see that there's correspondence going back and forth with Huma Abedin. Somebody asks about some Clinton papers. She says, they're on the bed in my hotel room. The door is unlocked. Just go in and get them. Now, all these 50 people who just earlier this week said that Donald Trump is not fit from a national security standpoint to be in office, this person who created multiple private servers to violate all the national security laws and put top secret and above top secret documents on it, who her assistants are putting her papers, her own personal papers, in their hotel room, leaving the door unlocked. Tell me how she is even remotely competent. But that's not even the key issue, okay? As we're looking at this, uh, the president of Judicial Watch charged, uh, again, as we said, that Clinton hid these documents. Uh, to contradict her official pledge in 2009 that she would remove herself from Clinton Foundation business. And so the New York Times comes back and says, well, the Clinton campaign has suggested that Mr. Bann, who's the top uh, official of the Clinton Foundation, was simply acting in his capacity as former President Bill Clinton's personal assistant, not in his role overseeing the Clinton Global Initiative. Well, that's a story in and of itself, a story that has been in the news for over a year and a half. People have been talking about the massive payoff for Bill Clinton. Look at this story from the Wall Street Journal going back to December. They say at Hillary Clinton's confirmation hearing for Secretary of State, she promised she would take extraordinary steps to avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest. Now, if we translate that into reality, if we go back and look at what really happened, uh, that those extraordinary steps were creating private servers, getting rid of a State Department inspector general, doing everything she can to avoid the appearance of criminal activity. And she has done that, and she's had the help of the Attorney General, as we will see here in just a moment. But then they also pointed out in the Wall Street Journal, more than two dozen companies and groups and one foreign government paid foreign President Bill Clinton a total of more than $8 million to give speeches around the time they also had matters before Mrs. Clinton's State Department. That was a Wall Street Journal analysis. Now, that was in December of 2015. Back in April, ABC had been talking about this. They said Bill Clinton cashed in when Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State. And they point out that he used to get $150,000 when he would speak. That's a pretty good fee for most people just giving a speech. But once Hillary became president, he started pulling in and oh, became Secretary of State. In 2010, 2011, he was getting paid $500,000 to speak to a Russian bank. He got paid $750,000 at a telecom conference in China. So that's five times what he had been making before. CNN pointed out in February this year, $153 million in Bill and Hillary Clinton speaking fees documented at that point in time. Okay, it's not just the $8 million that Wall Street Journal had talked about three months earlier. That was just essentially banks, okay? But CNN went through and looked at a full catalog and came up with a total of $153 million. They pointed out that Bill and Hillary, as they're...
putting out this influence, okay? 729 speeches from February 2001 until May. They got an average payday of $210,000 for each of these speeches. Uh, the two also reported at least $7.7 .7 million for 39 speeches to big banks, including Goldman Sachs and UBS. With Hillary Clinton, the Democrat 2016 frontrunner, collecting at least $1.8 million for at least eight speeches to big banks. Remember, this is back in February. This is when Bernie Sanders was making an issue. That didn't make an issue of her violation of national security, but did make an issue of her getting paid these big bucks for speaking to banks. And he said at the time... What being part of the establishment is, is in the last quarter, having a super PAC that raised $15 million from Wall Street, that throughout one's life raised a whole lot of money from drug companies and other special interests, said Bernie Sanders. Now, as the Daily Mail pointed out in this last December, it said Bill Clinton's speaking fees drew new attention as they line up with actions that his wife's State Department took between 2009 and 2013. In other words, look, folks, it's like this. It's the timing. Just as we saw with Obama paying the Iransom, okay, and saying there's nothing to see here. You know, we had this dispute that's been going on for 37 years. We just happened to send them a plane load of cash, $400 million on pallets from a Swiss bank in a foreign currency. We just happened to do that at the same time the hostages were released. It wasn't ransom. It's all about the timing. And if you look at the timing of what was going on with Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, it is far from coincidental. As the Daily Mail pointed out, they said two dozen different organizations paid the president while they had issues standing before the State Department. And as Breitbart pointed out in June uh, this year, the Chinese government paid Clinton, Bill Clinton, a massive speaking fee 10 days before Hillary made her quote unquote Asia pivot. Okay, where they turned to Asia. Now, this was documented in the book Clinton Cash, which the mainstream media wants to tell you absolutely nothing to see there. Move along. Uh, this is this is absolutely not true. But we are seeing how it is true. We can see from these emails that were released that Judicial Watch is putting there how the people at the top of the Clinton Foundation are contacting uh, Hillary Clinton's subordinates, telling them schedule these appointments, get these people and get them jobs in the State Department, get them appointments with the highest people at Lebanon and do it now. These guys are big donors. You understand, can't you? Do we have to, how, how many times do we have to draw the lines to connect the dots here? But here's what they say in the book Clinton Cash. At the center of the U.S. policy towards China was Hillary Clinton. At this critical time for U.S.-China relations, Bill Clinton gave a number of speeches that were underwritten by the Chinese government and its supporters. These funds were paid to the Clinton's bank account directly, while Hillary was negotiating with China on behalf of the United States. And in response to that, of course, Trump has said, tell me, folks, does that work? Hillary Clinton sold out our workers and our country for Beijing. This is what Trump says. Hillary Clinton has also been the biggest promoter of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will ship millions more of our jobs overseas and will give up congressional power to an international foreign commission. And oh, by the way, for all of those who are out there saying, oh, this is the, the TPP is set up. This is the way it's sold by the globalists in both parties at the top. The TPP is there to fight China, remember? Remember when Donald Trump pointed that out and they came back and said, no, 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 no. China's not part of the TPP. Look, China can be added as they were to the World Trade Organization at any time. Once we create the TPP, it creates an international commission. As Trump pointed out, China can be a part of that commission at any time. And that commission will decide which countries, which industries in which countries will prosper and which ones will be shut down. They will control your economy. You will have absolutely no control of it at the time. And remember, when we look at these cover-ups, and now I want to get to the cover-up now because... When we look at the way they've covered this up, it was just back on June 30th that we had the Department of Justice say they were going to delay for 27 months the request to produce correspondence with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's four top aides and the Clinton Foundation. 27 months. In other words, the middle of her first term. That was when they're going to put it out. That's the way the Department of Justice and the Obama administration has colluded with Hillary Clinton to cover up her crimes, just as they will not prosecute her for multiple felony violations of national security law. Now, in the press release that came out today, Judicial Watch laid out the steps of the cover-up, how they resisted trying to release this information. It was a very long time coming. They pointed out that even though they finally got some of these emails released, 
They said State Department spokesman Brock Johnson alerted Cheryl Mills and Hillary Clinton's then chief of staff that a significant Freedom of Information Act request had been made for records showing the number of email accounts used by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. So this was back in 2012. And if you look at that article, you can see that email from Brock Johnson to Cheryl Mills telling her that there is a FOIA request uh, looking for all of these emails, okay? Earlier this year, they say this was, these were finally produced in March of 2016. So it took from December 2012 to March of 2016 to get it. Why? Because they continually lied and said that they did not have any records. And he points out earlier this year, the State Department Office of Inspector General concluded that the statements coming from the State Department that, quote, there were no records response that was sent into response to this request was inaccurate and incomplete. And the Office of Inspector General, who, by the way, remember during Hillary Clinton's uh, tenure there at Secretary of State, there wasn't a permanent Office of Inspector General. She made sure that it was a temporary position that was being changed. But this person said, no, that's not true. That's inaccurate and untrue. Now, they point out uh, that in this email, he's, he warns Mills, tells her that we need to get this stuff. She acknowledges that, thanks him for it. And uh, as they were going through, they found that there were multiple people within the department that said uh, they were not even looking. Okay, May 10th, 2013, the Information Program Services replied to uh, the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. The people who sent the FOIA request said, uh, no records responsive to your request were located. Again, they get this from multiple organizations, multiple people within the State Department we're all lying about this, and they find from these email correspondents, they didn't even bother to look. They just said, there's nothing to see here, move on. We're not giving you information. Precisely what Hillary Clinton does on a day-to-day -day basis, when she's not throwing out red scare conspiracy. Welcome back, joining me now is Leanne McAdoo. We're gonna talk about this amazing reaction from the mainstream media going hysterical over the remarks of Donald Trump. Once trying again. to take them, yeah, once again, <laughs> putting them completely out of context, Leanne, and this is the BBC talking about this. Here's their headline, and it's very true. U.S. press is aghast at Trump gun remarks. The mainstream U.S. press has reacted to Donald Trump's remarks with dismay and with anger. Uh. And so we see people like Joe Scarborough, a former, as they call him, Republican congressman. This guy is a former globalist oligarch party congressman, the GOP. Uh, he now works with... Uh, uh, Mika Brzezinski, he said, a bloody line has been crossed that cannot be ignored at long last. Donald Trump, at long last, has just been at waiting for this, uh, has left the Republican Party few options but to act decisively and get his political train off the tracks before something terrible happens. Look, this is not an issue, folks. What yeah. he said yesterday, and, and this is something that I had commented on when I did uh, the fourth hour, I said gun ownership is up over 200% since Obama took office. As people have pointed out, if gun owners who have just started exercising their rights want to keep those rights, they will show up at the polls and they will have enough people to right. vote Hillary Clinton out. And some of the biggest increases that we have seen are in some of these swing states. And when you look at the crowds that we saw the same day that Donald Trump said this, he was addressing 7,000 people in North Carolina. Tim Kaine was here in Austin. Mm -hmm. Nobody would say how many people were at his little tiny Democrat only. It's so a few Democrat operatives, okay? <laughs> said, oh, a couple hundred. I don't think it was a couple hundred, okay? Right. And it's just the party faithful. And you can tell from his remarks, he's talking to just the party faithful. He's not talking to voters. There is a massive pushback. The establishment is absolutely freaking out about this. They are taking every comment that he makes and trying to find something there, twist it out of proportion. Right. But there are a lot of cases that you have that you want to talk about that they're ignoring yeah. uh, uh, that have been just as bad, even more direct, where they're talking about direct assassination. Literal they let that go. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's why I hate to even have to talk about this, because that's what they do. It's all about the spin, and so they're going to seize on anything that Donald Trump says. They don't care if they take it out of context. In fact, that's what they do. They chop the, the quotes off right before you know he finishes his sentence, and they spin it way out of control so that now everyone else has to work to spin it back into mm -hmm. context rather than focusing on the real issues. That's kind of a, 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 play, a play that's being used here in this election cycle. So Hillary Clinton comes out, immediately seizes on this, and says, a tweets, a person seeking to be the president of the United States should not suggest violence in any way. And of course, you know, as, as you've pointed out in the past, yeah, you know, you just discreetly shoot your political enemies 
roll them up in a carpet, <laughs> dump them in a park, and yeah. then call it suicide. Yeah. You know, that's how Hillary Clinton would, she wouldn't suggest violence in any <laughs> way. just do it, yeah. Right. And yeah. so, you know, now he's gotten U.S. Secret Service visits because this is just so serious, this claim. Now, let's recall back in 2008, Hillary Clinton literally said Obama might be murdered. Mm -hmm. So she, people were saying, you know, why aren't you dropping out of the race? You're trailing way behind here. And she actually went on to say she wouldn't drop out of the presidential race because anything can happen. And she cited the assassination of RFK. She said, we all remember Bobby Kennedy. He was assassinated in June in California. So Sounds you know. to me like she's suggesting somebody should do that if they really like <laughs> Hillary Clinton. Yeah. Uh, they could get rid of Obama and get Hillary Clinton that way. We've got a precedent there. So immediately her campaign starts pushing back, saying uh, people misinterpreted what I meant mm -hmm. and, and they took it out of context. And what am I, But here they're using the exact same tactics with Donald Trump. It's like they've learned now. And then, of course, let's not forget that Donald Trump has actually literally had people trying to make yeah. attempts against his life. And what does CNN do? So we had a, one gentleman who went on the stage, said he wanted to be a martyr, take out Donald Trump. Instead of condemning this behavior, they give him a prime time interview yeah. to explain why he wanted to be a martyr. Why would you try and assassinate a potential president? Because Trump's a bully and he deserves right. it, right? He, yes. That's what he said. They're, ju they're justifying it. Yeah. So it's okay if you want to freak out. And then, of course, we had the guy that tried to uh, grab the, the police officer's gun there in Las Vegas, said that mm -hmm. he was ready to do it. We actually had someone earlier today climbing the Trump Tower, of course, where Trump's campaign headquarters are. So he's there climbing still, you know, what does Wolf Blitzer say? You know, well, we don't know. Maybe he's just trying to make a political statement. Hmm. He's Maybe. just... Maybe they're shooting a sequel to uh, Mission Impossible. Yeah, he must just be really <laughs> upset to find out that Bernie Sanders was indeed a sellout. So now he's actually going to tr climb Trump Towers. I mean, this is what Donald Trump is actually having to deal with. And it's, mm -hmm. it's cause celebre for the, the press. Uh, then let's flash back to uh, one of Hillary's strategists. This is Bob Beckel. He came out uh, during the whole uh, WikiLeaks scandal there with Julian Assange saying, there's only one way to do it, illegally shoot the son of a bee. Yeah. You know, so he, I mean, he just came right out and said it. Julian Assange knows that. He knows, uh, just like Donald Trump, that uh, it, it's either Hillary loses or they're going to lose their lives because that's right. the kind of gangster she is. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. She is the person who really carries through on these, on these uh, threats, as you pointed out. Yeah, that, yeah, and that's the thing. is like she knows how to work the system. She knows how to blackmail people. Mm -hmm. She's got enough people in her pocket. That's why even we have... Uh, this and this is where we're getting to is why do they constantly spin us all this way when we need to be focusing on the issues, focusing on all the scandals surrounding Hillary Clinton? They're not talking about those things. They're constantly pivoting us away. Why? Well, obviously, yesterday it was just this whole week, really, um, all about Hillary's health, questioning her health condition. We see these pictures coming out, uh, obviously her cough that she's had for years now showing that indeed we do need to see her medical records people deserve to know if are we putting this sick ill woman and i don't mean mentally because we that way <laughs> i think we all can agree there are we putting her in the most powerful position here mm -hmm. in america mm -hmm. and then of course we had uh the gay nightclub mass murdering terrorist father um there behind her at the political rally her telefan yeah her telefan and and that's not strange or bizarre seeing as right. how you have to be invited and you have to be vetted to be able to sit behind the presidential candidate and especially someone like Hillary Clinton who doesn't even allow the press to get out of their little roped off corral when they're trying to talk mm -hmm. talk to her. So well, and they honor Black Lives Matter when they have explicitly called for the execution of police and have had uh, people who said that they did it because of Black Lives Matter. So they allowed them to do it. and the Democrat Party honors them as well. Right. Exactly. Brings them up on stage there in the DNC. Mm -hmm. And then so she, of course, after we put out this letter here once again with our viral articles saying Hillary must disavow. That was at the top of Drudge all day. So then she puts out a statement. Her campaign says we do disavow his endorsement. We don't agree with his ideology. And I'm sorry, but that's exactly what Donald Trump said many, many times mm -hmm. when he was, mm -hmm. you know, disavow David Duke, disavow. He didn't ask for David Duke's endorsement. And he right? didn't put him on the podium behind him either, as right. Hillary Clinton did. That's exactly. the key issue. And she needs to explain why someone with an extremist ideology like Omar Mateen's father thinks that she'd be the best candidate for the president of mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. Of course, now Julian Assange also points out how anything that's going to be uh, linked to some sort of a scandal with Hillary Clinton, Russia did it. 
Yeah. So that's the other yeah. new thing is to spin it and say Russia As I pointed out, she's blaming Jill Stein. She says Jill Stein is a Putin puppet now. Right. Exactly. <laughs> because she's competition to her. This is her conspiracy theories, okay? The vast left-wing conspiracy theories of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and and uh, Assange says, I'm sorry, but this is to just p pivot at all of her many connections to Russia. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. indeed, it may look like it wasn't Russia at all with uh, WikiLeaks putting out a $20,000 reward for any information leading to... Uh, the arrest of the person who murdered Seth Rich, who they are saying, you know, possibly he could have been the person that was behind those DNC leaks, being a, a data analyst yeah. there with the DNC. You know, I, I want to say something, too, because, uh, you know, Donald Trump, in no way, in my opinion, was he talking about calling for the assassination of Hillary Not Clinton. That's a ridiculous reach. But let's talk about the violence that is going to happen if Hillary Clinton gets her way. We have seen how dangerous gun-free zones are in Chicago. We're going to talk to Joe Biggs in the next segment about what college professors here in Texas are trying to do to push back against open carry laws. But understand that as we saw gun control enacted in Venezuela, they spent $53 million for each of these gun control centers, and the people obediently turned them into the socialist government. And then what did we see? We saw police officers being hunted down on the streets. We reported this uh, back in November 2015 on Infowars.com. Police officers being hunted down on the street and killed for their firearms. That's the situation that's going to be there for the police. And you have to understand this. We don't depend on the Second Amendment for our rights. Our rights come from God. They're natural and inherent rights that we possess as human beings. The Second Amendment merely says to the government, don't take these rights that we already possess away from us. Draws a large line around those things. If you're going to ignore that, we're going to ignore your confiscation rules. We will fight you in the streets over this. It will happen. It will become very violent. And even if people turn this in passively, as we saw in Venezuela, it will not work out good for the police. So you have to understand, this is a very dangerous thing the Democrats are trying to do. When we come back, we're going to talk about what they're trying to do here in Texas. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me now is Joe Biggs. And Joe, as we've seen and talked about the last uh, day and a half, we talked about this earlier in the show, the media twists and distorts and gets into hysterical fits about what Donald Trump warned about the people who want to take away our Second Amendment rights. And we're seeing that here unfold in Texas on the campuses. We've got three tenured professors who are fighting a, an, a, a carry law that is about to go into effect here on campus. They want to prohibit it in their classrooms, even though there's been an explicit law in Texas to allow this? Well, it's actually already gone into effect as of August 1st. Mm, okay. So it's now, it's there. It's, it's set in stone. Yeah, these three professors are Mia Carter, Jennifer Glass, and Lisa Moore. And they're worried about the fact that, you know, some student's going to be mad because they don't get an A if they didn't earn it. And they feel like these students are going to pull a gun out and go, hey, you know, give me an A. I don't deserve a C. You know, but here's the thing, though. Think about the process you go through to get a concealed handgun license. It's very tedious. I mean, uh, you've got to go through fingerprints, courses, all this stuff, and then you get it. But what you get in the in-classroom portion are lawyers who s specifically specialize in handgun use. And what they do is scare the hell out of you. Yeah, yeah. They if tell you just you, pull that out and wave it around to intimidate yeah, somebody, yeah. you're going to jail. You know, it's, it's, The thing it's, is, though, is there's no epidemic of law-abiding gun owners running around and pulling guns on people that's right. and shooting people. It's criminals. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need campus carry. That's why we need the Second Amendment to give us that edge against those people who aren't law-abiding and who haven't been through that training and don't understand what it means or they don't even care about the loss or, the, you know, the the stuff that can happen to them for doing that. And to be clear, here in Texas, it doesn't allow open carry. It allows only if you have a concealed carry license. So mm -hmm. as you point out, these people have been vetted, they've been trained, and there also are exclusions for these professors, okay? So if they have a private office, uh, they can put a notice up and say, you know, if this is their exclusive private office, they can say, I don't want to have handguns in here. But a classroom is different. It's a common area. Just like they have exemptions in the residence hall areas, okay? But in the common areas of the residence hall, they're allowed to carry it. So, you know, you have a privacy there where you can say, this is, I don't want guns in my private living space or in my personal office, but you can't prohibit it for the common areas, which is what these people want to do. They don't want anybody to have any guns anywhere. It's completely and totally ridiculous. I mean, right here, this is in the Texas Tribune. Um, it says, to put into terms, these professors should understand the clinical trials are over and campus carry has been shown to pose little risk to public safety. Uh, campus carry has been allowed on more than 100 college campuses across the country 
thus far. And it was the same kind of hysteria back in January when open carry in Texas mm -hmm. came into play mm -hmm. for pistols. Mm -hmm. It's been an effect that I have hardly seen anyone running around open carrying at all. It's just now we have that freedom that if you want to do so, you can do it. It doesn't mean you're going to do it. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to be out here waving guns around. And I think it's like less than, it's like 1% of students at UT are actually licensed concealed handgun licensed carriers. So, And the reason we're doing this is not just to protect these individuals' right of self-defense, but it makes the whole area safer. Because if you don't know who's carrying, if you do have uh, people carrying and it's not a gun-free zone, uh, statistics have shown that you're less likely to have a mass shooting event. But I think it's interesting, Joe, when we look at this, uh, they're saying that, uh, look, we don't really, this is what the liberal professors are saying, okay, these tenured professors say, it's not clear what the law is. No, the, the law is very clear. It's, it's very clear, just like the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. You just don't like the law. You know, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment make it very clear that if the government, if the federal government is not expressly given permission to do something, they're prohibited. And what it says here in this law is that unless you are expressly prohibited from carrying in a certain area, and besides the uh, residence halls, besides mm -hmm. individual offices, you can't take it into a bar. Sorority. You can't do it into, yeah, you can't take it into an intercollegiate uh, event. Mm -hmm. If they have K through 12 classes, you can't take it in there. But other than that, other than those private areas, those public events, you're allowed to carry. It's, it's very clear. And so what they're saying is uh, we, don't, we, we don't know what the law is. That's always what they say, and it is very clear. But then they're also going in, and the attorney general says, look, there's going to be penalties for you if you violate this law. We're going to take sanctions against you, even if you are a tenured professor. These tenured professors think they are God. Yeah. And, and I have sat in these socialist professors' classes as a student. I walked out of one of them and dropped the class, because it was pretty apparent from the very beginning. This guy was as hardcore Marxist as they come. He wasn't going to teach us anything other than hammer down his personal Marxist philosophy. And that's the way these guys are. Once they get tenure, they think you can't do anything to them. Well, we'll see if that's really going to happen with this. Yeah, one of my buddies, we were actually at a campus carry protest. It was all the, uh, they were doing the dildo protests, the open carry of the dildos, and they're marching around talking about how basically fear-mongering, which is funny because they always mm -hmm. say that we're fear-mongering. They're sitting there saying that if, you know, open carry, campus carry happens, that everyone's going to be shot and killed and everyone's going to die. When in fact, like we've said before, law-abiding citizens are not there to cause harm at all. They are there to have that. Just in case something were to happen, they don't want to be a victim. Yeah. Who wants to be a victim? Yeah. You don't want to be sitting there bleeding out going, man, I wish I would have done something. You know, you can learn a lot. I, I want to encourage each and every person out there, if you don't have a concealed license, go and get one. It's not that bad. I mean, it's a little tedious with some paperwork, but I mean, really, at the end of the day, depending on what state you live in, it can be quick. It can be done within a day or up to two weeks, mm -hmm. but uh, it can save a life. It can save many other people's lives because we know criminals go after weak targets. We saw what happened uh, with the, the soldiers and uh, sailors at the Chattanooga Army installation there where these yeah, guys where they were prohibit shot soldiers and sailors from having people who are trained, trained yeah. to use it. Exactly. Those are the people you want to have, and criminals know that those are gun free mm -hmm. zones. When he posts up those placards saying this is a gun free zone, you're making yourself a target. Yes. And criminals are not going to go into a situation where they think there's a chance that they're going to get killed before they carry out whatever crazy thing they're trying to do. And we saw James O'Keefe go to congressmen who mm -hmm. are big gun control advocates and their staffers and say, uh, We've got a sign here, and, and we're an organization. We really want to, to make it clear that we support gun-free zones. So we'd like to give you this sign to put into your yard to say that it's a gun-free zone. And these are people who live in high-crime areas, and they say, yeah, I'm not putting that in my yard. That would put a target on my back, okay? They know that as well. And John Lott has pointed out that since the 1950s, I forget the exact year, 1950, there's only been two mass shootings in an area where there was not a gun-free zone. Okay, so criminals understand that. We see this over and over again. It's just common sense. But it is also the law that these people think that they're above. That's why we have to be concerned because it's not just tenured professors. It's tenured Supreme Court justices, mm -hmm. people who are tenured for life, people who cannot be removed. And we have uh, the rest of the government that will not stand up to a Supreme Court decision. I believe the idea that Supreme Court uh, can rule these laws and nobody can challenge that or will challenge it. I think that's totally false. Thomas Jefferson didn't believe that. He didn't agree with Marbury versus Madison where the Supreme Court gave themselves the final word, the ultimate word on reviewing of all laws. He said, if you do that, you're going to have tyranny of the courts. That's what we have now. That's why it is really key. And all these people who say they're never Trump, they're not going to vote for Trump. 
understand what Hillary Clinton is going to do to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. It's hanging by a thread right now. And it's not just going to be three tenured professors, okay? It's going to be nine tenured Supreme Court justices or six out of the nine. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what's going on with all this. But, I mean, at the end of the day, UT is going to be a lot safer. Yeah. You're going to have a lot of these guys, a lot of the people that go there that do this campus carry. I know a lot of them are ex-military. A lot of them done contracting work. They're older, you know, guys and gals who have trained, who go to the, the gun range, you know, constantly and keep up on their training and tactics and procedures and understand the safety risk and what to do and what not to do. It's good to have that there because these guys come out there and when they have free range to do whatever they want, many people can be killed. Yeah. This is really going to slow that down. So I'm all for it. I'm not the biggest fan of having to go through CHL and stuff like that. I'm more of a constitutional carry kind of guy. Yeah. I think we should all have that right to be able to carry. Does that mean that you have to? No, but I would like the freedom to be able to go buy a gun. And then if I want to open carry it, conceal carry it, whatever, in whatever state, I should be able to so I can protect myself, my family, my property. You're right. I, I think what we're going to see out of this is uh, it's going to be a safer campus. I think it's going to be a better campus because you're going to have some of these college professors who uh, are so afraid of guns and want to uh, shut them down at every opportunity. Maybe they'll go somewhere in Massachusetts where they can uh, be more comfortable, where they'll fit in a little bit better. I yeah, think. Get the hell out yeah. of here. Excellent. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, that's, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be back, and we're going to cover some technology stories. Uh, of course, we've talked about Minority Report and how they're already identifying people in Chicago, one of the best uh, gun-free zones you can find. They're already targeting people there who have not even committed crimes, but they're extending that now to children, labeling children as possible future criminals. So we're going to take a look at some of the newest technology updates and how it threatens your freedoms. We'll be right back. I want to ask Steve Quayle of stevequelt.com, one of the original preppers, one of the original patriots in America, 25 plus years on air, one of the first people I interviewed when I got on air 21 years ago, where he thinks the Trump revolution's going, what he thinks of Brexit, are these not good signs of an awakening? I know on top of that, horrible global government, horrible economic numbers, forced inoculations, open borders, TB pouring across, Jihadis pouring across. I want to ask him, what is the state of the world right now? What is he most focused on? What is he most concerned about? He also has hosted TV shows. He has a new amazing DVD film out we'll be telling you about in the next hour. True Legends, the series.com, stevequell.com. I want to ask Steve Quayle, who saw this you know, way far off, first got a report on geoengineering Kim trailing. I'm, I'm not kissing his butt. It, it, it's true. First guy that I'd get him on because he was interesting, and I knew a lot of stuff he was saying was true. A lot of it was so far out. Human, animal, chimera splicing already going on. I went and searched it, found one BBC article admitting that a decade before it was already happening. So I started going, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about, but why wouldn't they show us the humanities? Why wouldn't they show us the part human, part cows being produced? Why wouldn't they show us the spider goats? Now they started to. The last decade, until last week, the Associated Press, that's the mouth of Sauron, said, oh, we're splicing humans and animals and raising them inside other animals, and we're going to have all these organs, and they don't have rights because they're part animal, part human. See, this no man's land, everything Steve Quayle wrote about in his genetic Armageddon work and his, uh, I mean, all of his books, which a lot of them are out of print. So uh, uh, enough lavishing praise on Mr. Quayle. Uh, Steve, let's get into the state of the world, kind of a big picture from 35,000 feet, then let's zoom in on particulars. But I'm telling you, the nightmare dystopia that you foresaw 25 years ago, uh, it is more and more a reality, spot on, unfortunately. A, how did you know all this? And B, what's, what's the next shoe to drop? Well, I think, Alex, you know, my perspective when I started on talk radio, uh, you know, 25 plus years ago was the fact that I began to be a student of prophecy and the bottom line is the one world government, the one world religion, and the one world economic uh, meltdown along with the world currency. And we're seeing that all. But you used a word I want to really focus in. Lawlessness is in the land. The cover-up, you know, the situation of four mysterious deaths connected to the DNC in less than a month. And these are the who's who. And how about Bob Bickle calling for the assassination? Now, these are his words, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just kill the son of a bitch. So those are his words. And Alex is the total 
uh, breakdown of everything that we used to know was truth, and we're seeing the implementation of total lies. And the total implementation of lies, look, that's what you've been doing. And I want to encourage people, support Alex, support those of us who are out there uh, 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 sounding the alarms. And Alex, right now, it's like we're looking at everything in perspective. We're looking at it retrospect, but it's, it's upon us. When I said on Coast to Coast 20-some years ago, excuse me, that I see civil war, and I warned the police in those days, and I warned the different, even gang members going on record with those over the airwaves, look, you guys, you're going to be used as pawns. And isn't it interesting, the same people that want to take away our Second Amendment are absolutely covering up, you know, the lone gunman, the false flags. You and I have dealt with that for years. How is it that the first reports are always multiple gunmen? And by the time the mainstream vomit brokers get done, it's a single guy and he's not, uh, you know, out there. Well, we know uh, there were five people in, in Nice, France, and they covered that up. Yep. Yeah, so there's a cover-up. And I want to share something with everybody. Turn the bloody networks off. CNN has always been communist network news. And we're right, Alex, in the middle of a complete communist attempt at takeover and control. Some people don't like to use that word, but you're talking about people as young as 27 years old, Seth Conrad, Rich, what, he, he, he was only 27. Then you got John Ash, he's murdered. You got Victor Thorne, who's the author of books exposing the Clintons. And then you've got Sean Lucas, lead attorney for the anti-Clinton DNC fraud. So ladies and gentlemen, when DNC, uh, people start being destroyed from within their own group. And by the way, I, absolutely, go, go back to Assange a few weeks ago. He said, this is not the Russians. And now he's saying basically th 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 that, yes, this guy was probably his source. He doesn't want to say. But the point is, is that now he's dead. I mean, this is a serious message. You were the first two when it was only like 50 or something. Now it's like 400 when they started killing all the top microbiologists. I mean, running a, over them with a van, you know, at the University of Houston and backing back over them, cutting people's heads off, chopping their hearts out, torturing them to death, shooting them, killing their families all over the world. The microbiologists. Sorry. No, it was only not only microbiologists, but it was lead virologists, lead immunologists. And here was the deal, Alex. Most people can't still put it together. And now, as you know, it's now natural health practitioners. I think that's 52 or 54 so far. The, everyone has got to understand DNC is openly advocating becoming Murder, Inc., okay? Now, we know you've had Larry on, uh, you know, former Clinton aide. Uh, you know, talking about all the deaths under the former Clinton administration the and present Clinton administration, the uh, inability for a known traitor, as Hillary is, to basically even be prosecuted tells you how deep the tentacles go into the federal government. And iniquity is abounding. That's, that's absolutely, I, I'd say, uh, evident to everybody. So let's talk about what the most important things are. I said, and you know this, we've done this in the past, probably a decade ago, that it will be the goal of the New World Order to turn the police against the people and the people against the police. I've even gone on record with a lot of police, law enforcement officers, you know them, I know them, intel guys. I'm saying, look, watch who's in your ranks. Watch who they put into your departments. There's usually hitters, which is mean, means an assassin, and there's also the spies. Well, that's it for tonight's Nightly News. We thank you for watching. If you're not a subscriber and a supporter of the InfoWars Nightly News, we please ask that you would consider supporting our operation, becoming a paid subscriber. You will get the entire Nightly News in HD as it happens each night. You'll also have access to all of Alex Jones's documentaries and all of his books all online. Thank you so much for supporting us. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the InfoWars Nightly News.